Welcome uh, to uh, day two, uh, this panel on industrial policy. <gasps> I cannot believe I'm saying the words industrial policy. I cannot believe I'm saying the words industrial policy. I thought neoliberalism had put a dagger through the heart of industrial policy and that it would never rise again. <laughs> but it is. It is. State capitalism is back and back with a vengeance. Um, so, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm feeling a bit adrift because, like, you know, if I think of my own history, you know, going back to being a banker during the debt crisis, and what was one of the causes of the debt crisis? Extensive lending to inefficient state owned enterprises. And after the debt crisis, what did I work on? Privatization of state owned enterprises. Right? The separation of the state and the economy. That's what we worked on. I worked on it around the world. Privatization of state-owned enterprise. And I'm feeling doubly adrift because I even wrote a book called Exporting Capitalism. It should have been called Exporting State Capitalism. So, as I say, I'm feeling a little adrift at the, in this present uh, period of a return of industrial policy. Um, even if we agreed that industrial policy was essential to development and growth uh, and competition, uh, and of course we see the United States playing a leading role now in industrial policy, we might disagree on what the priorities are and what the sequencing of policies should be. And in Rashomon type fashion, we have a great panel here, a rock star panel, that's going to help us walk around some of the issues involved in uh, industrial policy, and again, what the priorities and sequencing might be. So we have Jacob Moscana from Harvard, uh, who's going to focus on innovation, uh, and perhaps the role of the state in promoting innovation. Uh, our colleague Richard Rogerson from Princeton, who's going to focus on productivity growth. And again, Richard, the role of the state in promoting productivity growth. And Zainab Usman, my Carnegie colleague, who will be talking about the political economy of industrial policy, obviously a very crucial issue. Um, and if there is time, I might take a minute to talk about private sector development and the role of the state in promoting private enterprise. Um, but we'll see. So without further ado, uh, Jacob, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, so first, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to have the chance to uh, present here. Uh, so as was just, was just mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation and technology diffusion and try to argue that understanding the process of innovation is important for trying to design industrial policy, but also that innovation policy is something that sort of government should think about when thinking about uh, uh, economic development. So, so I'm going to so one um, sort of important feature or fact about global innovation is that most technology development, most research and development ha happens in a handful of rich countries. Something like 25% of global R&D investment happens in, in just the US. And there's a growing realization, a growing sort of accumulated body of evidence suggesting that those rich world technologies, technologies designed by and for rich countries, aren't always appropriate everywhere. Or might not be the exact technologies that are most useful or most productivity enhancing in different parts of the world. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is give you kind of three examples of where that happens and why it matters. Examples of this technology mismatch and ways that it might be constraining productivity growth in, in Africa. The three examples that I'm going to focus on, one from manufacturing, one from agriculture, and one related to climate change adaptation. And then in the end, kind of the big picture uh, kind of point that I want to argue is that this idea of technology mismatch is really prevalent. It's really important for understanding productivity differences, and it's important to take into account when thinking about how you want to design industrial policy, how you want to think about productivity growth going forward. Going forward, But kind of more directly, I think that sort of incentivizing and directing innovation, the focus of R&D, could be as important for productivity growth in the future as redirecting production or more standard forms of industrial policy. So first, jumping into the first example. So that's gonna, the talk is going to be kind of those three examples and then a little bit of discussion at the end. So first, kind of the first example is, is manufacturing. So here's a figure kind of summarizing one kind of important feature about innovation in, in global manufacturing in the, last, in the last few decades. So this is showing you the labor share in the US of a series of key industries. 
And one thing that you'll note is manufacturing, that blue line, has been declining sharply over the course of the past several decades. And this kind of growing work that's really driven by the predominance of automation and automation technology and R&D. So kind of the story about innovation in the past several decades in manufacturing is a rise of automation, basically increasing the capital share of the most productive firms in, in rich countries. This new technology is basically automating away labor. Now, what does that mean for the rest of the world that's trying to kind of adopt these frontier or you know, kind of top technologies and incorporate them into production? Here I'm showing you, and I'm basing this on work by uh, Diao et al., kind of some recent work on kind of this appropriate technology idea in African manufacturing using new evidence that they put together from Tanzania and Ethiopia. What I'm showing you here is two graphs. On the y-axis of the graph is the capital uh, labor ratio of, of firms in their data. And on the x-axis is just kind of the year. What you can see here is that both in Tanzania and Ethiopia, the largest, most productive firms, have capital labor ratios way in excess of the economy as a whole, which is that blue line. So these most productive firms, these large firms, are trying to use this kind of you know, uh, te imported technology. As a result, they're using capital labor ratios that are more representative of, of the US and other more advanced economies, and capital labor ratios way in excess of the population as a whole. So that's this idea that there's this mismatch. There's a mismatch between the, the way that technology is designed designed for using lots of capital and relatively little, little labor with the kind of existing uh, types of inputs that exist, exist in the country at large. So what does that mean? Well, this paper argues that has a really important impact on the extent to which manufacturing can actually absorb labor. So what is this graph showing? And actually, there was a, the, almost the same graph was shown in a presentation yesterday, which is kind of cool. Um, this graph is showing that sort of in both Tanzania and in Ethiopia, there's been a big rise in productivity uh, in, in employment and manufacturing. That's that green line, green line. But that rise has basically been driven almost entirely by employment growth in relatively unproductive small and informal firms. And these productive large manufacturing firms that are using those high, that modern technology are basically unable to absorb uh, kind of a lot of, a lot of the, the labor that's been coming into manufacturing. So what does this mean? And suggest that kind of a typical type of industrial policy where you're kind of subsidizing sort of standard manufacturing sectors and kind of large firms in particular in those sectors might not make the most sense here, especially in the short run. It suggests that, you know, even if you kind of, that, that kind of large manufacturing firms are already high, high productivity, but that because of the types of technology they're using and it's mismatched with kind of the prevailing inputs that exist in the population, it's not absorbing a lot of the population coming, coming into manufacturing and it's limiting the overall extent of productivity growth in the sector as a whole suggesting that maybe industrial policy here, as a result of the prevailing technology, should focus first on kind of not the largest firms in the economy, but also more on sort of non-traditional sort of manufacturing sector, service sector growth, et cetera, and there's growing evidence that that can actually have large productivity effects. So that's manufacturing and kind of mismatch driven by kind of the capital intensity or capital requirements of technology developed in rich countries and the relative capital scarcity in different parts of the world. And the same story could probably be told in terms of skill abundance and skill scarcity. Well, what about sort of agriculture? So people tend to think that like agricultural productivity growth is something that's really important underlying sort of structural transformation and, and movement out of agriculture and the economy as a whole. But you know, there's some recent work that, that I've done with a, a co-author actually coming to Princeton next year, Karthik Sastry, showing that sort of a similar story, this technology mismatch story, is also potentially constraining productivity growth in, manufacture, in, in agriculture. So what, are the, what is this photo? So these are, these are three worms. It turns out these are three of the dominant threats to corn production in different parts of the world. The first two that I'm showing you are the European maize borer and maize rootworm, respectively. Okay? These are dominant threats in the US and parts of Europe, and perhaps as a result have been the subject of massive amounts of R&D. Thousands and thousands of patents, many by large sort of biotechnology companies designed to specifically combat these threats in particular, culminating even in the development of genetically modified corn varieties designed to express toxins that target specific receptors on the intestinal lining of like these two pests. But again, you know, technology mismatch here might matter. These specific technologies designed for rich world threats to agricultural production might be less productive elsewhere. And as one example, that third photo is the maize stock borer, which is a dominant threat to corn production in much of sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Central and Eastern Africa. It's not the subject of much independent research and development. The types of technologies designed to work for the first two don't work against the third one as well. And by some estimates, it continues to decimate upwards of 10% of corn production in Kenya sort of each year. 
So again, there's this mismatch, okay? So even if you wanted to get all the best technology into parts of Sub-Saharan Africa to try to expand agricultural productivity growth, there's a mismatch between what that technology does and is designed to do and would do, and the constraints to production in large parts of Africa on the ground. So in this case, it's a mismatch between the technology is designed to fight certain bugs, and those aren't the bugs you got. Okay, but the question is sort of, there, this is kind of one example, to what extent is this sort of systematically true, and does it actually explain productivity differences across countries? So that's what we tried to, tried to answer in this, in this new paper that I'm just citing at the bottom here. Um, and, and for a second, just focus on the, the graph on, uh, on the left. So we basically put together data on uh, not just those three pests, but like all pests and pathogens around the world, trying to understand their distribution, the extent to which they're the subject of innovation, and then how productivity varies depending on how similar or different your pests are from the pests that are the focus of innovation. And, and that first graph on the left, it's a histogram of the productivity loss in all countries from just this mismatch between the pests that you have and the pests that are the focus of innovation. So two things you can notice. One, this is across a range of countries resulting in a large amount of productivity loss. So on average, it's about 58%. The world is about 58% less productive in agriculture as a result of this mismatch between you know, what technology focuses on and the types of kind of pests and pathogens that live in different parts of the world. But sort of more striking, perhaps especially for this, this conference, is that that histogram is color-coded. And so Africa is in green. So what you see is that this is especially costly for large parts of Africa, and particularly sub-Saharan Africa, which isn't, which isn't coded there, as a result of the fact that large parts of Africa have this highest pest and pathogen mismatch, are most, not necessarily ecologically bad in some absolute sense, but are most ecologically mismatched with the ecological features with the exact types of pests and pathogens that innovation focuses on. So in Africa, on average, this leads to a not 58%, but 74% reduction in average agricultural productivity. And they're really kind of countries in Africa are occupying the far right side of that, of that histogram. So th this is, uh, you know, it was not just manufacturing, also agriculture. There's this mismatch between what technology does and what's sort of needed on the ground. The final example that I'm going to talk about is, is climate change adaptation. So there's this kind of growing sense that the development of new technology, new innovation, is a potentially important source of adaptation to climate change, an important way that economies are going to become resilient to, to kind of rising threats from climate change. And here, too, I'm going to argue that there's at least some evidence of, of mismatch. So I'm going to focus here on agriculture because that's the work that I've done, but I think this story is probably true more broadly. So in another paper, with also with Karthik Sastry, we show that Research and development, the development of new agricultural technologies, things like heat-resistant seed varieties, has responded dramatically to the pattern of climate damage that's happened in the U.S. over the course of the past several decades. So in particular, crops get hit by extreme heat shocks, etc. Big companies like Monsanto, but also, you know, research universities, uh, the, the U.S. federal government, works to invest in R&D and develop seed varieties and other technologies that make production more resilient. However, in that paper, we show there's no evidence that innovation as a whole in the globe is responding to the pattern of damages in different parts of the world. So when, for example, parts of sub-Saharan Africa get hit by a heat shock, and that affects particular crops there, there's no evidence that technology is reacting to those, those threats. Now, again, that might not matter if, as the kind of standard narrative suggests, well, but if these technologies are getting developed for the U.S., you know, maybe that's fine, and then the rest of the world can just use them and adapt using those same technologies. Well, you know, the results that I just presented on this kind of mismatch in pest and pathogen environment already suggest that that's maybe not so simple. But there's an even more fundamental reason why that's not so simple, which is what I'm showing you here, usually some new data we put together, which is that even at a, the crops that are getting most damage in the US are not the same crops as the ones that are getting most damage in different parts of the world. So what's this graph showing? On the y-axis of this graph is what we're calling extreme exposure. Think of that as like damaging heat exposure over the course of the last 50 years to each crop in the U.S. And on the x-axis, it's the same measure but for Africa. And you can see there's no positive correlation across crops in which crops are getting damaged in the U.S. and which crops are getting damaged in Africa. So as one example, you know, sorghum is like really damaged in Africa. If there's one crop that you want a heat resistant seed variety for to facilitate kind of production resilience of sorghum, compared to other crops, that's not that damaged in the US. And as a result, technology is not going to get pulled there, sort of to the extent that past this prologue. So, you know, and this is kind of just focusing on agriculture and this mismatch in terms of pests and pathogens or different types of crops. But you can imagine that more generally in terms of adaptation to climate change, the types of technologies that are going to work in high-income countries and that there are going to be all of these incentives to develop because of large markets, because of effective IP protection, are not necessarily going to be the ones that are most appropriate for 
uh, different parts of the world. And that technology mismatch could be a really important problem in terms of technology's ability to adapt to climate change. So those are the three examples, sort of one from uh, manufacturing, one from agriculture, and finally from, oops, going the wrong way, finally from climate change. So, so what do we learn from all of that? How does that shape the way we think about industrial policy? And is there anything to do about this? So, so just one slide on that. Um, uh, one theme of this, of this conference, and something that already came up yesterday, is the impact of the rise of other emerging economies, and most notably China, but also kind of Brazil and India, on African development. And there are a number of ways that that can matter. But one way that it might be particularly important in this context is that as those, as those countries become more innovative, the types of technologies that they develop might actually have a lower mismatch with large parts of, of sub-Saharan Africa. Because they're in a more similar place in development to Africa as compared to the US in terms of you know, skilled labor ratios, capital uh, labor ratios. Also because they're on average more ecologically similar to parts of Africa in the context of agriculture than the current you know, set of most innovative countries like the US. So as one example, there are already kind of technology sharing programs between Brazil and a number of countries in Africa on account of the fact that there's ecological similarity there and perhaps opportunities for technology sharing from technology getting developed in Brazil uh, to, that's potentially really useful in Africa. So I think one thing to think about more as those countries become more innovative is developing programs to actually facilitate that diffusion of technology and research collaboration because that could be one way of lowering kind of mismatch uh, as the technologies they develop could be kind of more suitable to parts of Africa than, than the existing kind of uh, technology mix. Second, so I think it's really important to think about R&D policy as an important part of, part of development policy. And this is one area where kind of uh, international uh, collaboration across countries within Africa could be really important. So I think that kind of one way to incentivize R&D, not the only way, but one sort of important way, is thinking about enforcing intellectual property protection. Not necessarily kind of across the board. You can imagine a smarter policy where you're really trying to target IP uh, law toward technologies where mismatch is highest, where you really want to incentivize the development of technology sort of for your country. And here's where international cooperation can be important because any one country by itself might have a limited ability to shift global innovation, to shift global investment. But to the extent that many countries can collaborate on this and sort of jointly enforce intellectual property protection, that could actually have a bigger role on account of the larger market size, et cetera, on incentivizing a, a shift in global research and development sort of writ large. That's important here. Also, I think there's, there's argument to be made that kind of uh, for, for, for kind of public sector investment in R&D. I think, you know, the few examples that we have of, of that kind of historically in agriculture, I'm listing two here. One is the Green Revolution, kind of this big period of uh, R&D investment in the 1960s. And the second is Embrapa, which is a, a program in Brazil that started in the 1970s to put a lot of money kind of invested in, in the development of local agricultural technologies. There have been many successes that have come out of, of, those, of the, those historical episodes. Some failures that I think it's possible to learn from, but I think that that suggests that exploring kind of more broadly policies about investing in R&D could be, could be really important. And finally, I think there's an important interplay between redirecting innovation um, and redirecting, redirecting industry. I think that, you know, as the manufacturing example especially showed, you know, just redirecting industry without thinking about the technology piece might not be so effective. You could provide all types of incentives for kind of movement into manufacturing, but if you don't have the right sort of, um, if, if the kind of modern technology isn't appropriate for your local kind of input mix, your local conditions, even if you provide lots of incentives, you're not necessarily going to raise productivity much if, if technology sort of isn't right for you. The flip side, though, is that by developing sort of more appropriate technology, technology with lower mismatch to your context, that could raise productivity in ways that kind of have these spillover effects, further encouraging the movement into those sectors, and that could kind of be this kind of you know positive positive feedback loop there. And then, moreover, by kind of raising you know domestic industry size through either industrial policy or a combination of industrial and innovation policy, that could further incentivize the development of new technology sort of for that market because the market is larger, and 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 so there are these kind of um, there's this interplay between these two sides of the story that I think could be really important um, to sort of uh, explore, explore going forward. Um, and I just wanted to sort of conclude with one sort of uh, look to history. I think that, you know, um, this idea that sort of uh, innovation uh, policy, R&D policy is something that sort of is really important for sort of high income countries to think about when they think about, you know, industrial policy and think about public policy, but it's sort of less important for the rest of the world, which might be able to just adopt foreign technology. Um, that has kind of, I guess, uh, kind of grown, grown in recent decades, but the idea that sort of uh, technology mismatch is a really important thing to think about in the context of development, that innovation is a really important part of development sort of for all countries is, is actually an old one. 
And sort of in, in reading for this, for this talk, I came across the Nobel Prize lecture of, of, of Kuznets, who in 1971 was writing exactly about these types of issues. Um, so he writes that, you know, reading in red here, that the stock of innovations most suitable to the needs of the less developed countries is not too abundant. And at least one implication of this is sufficiently intriguing and seems to be illuminating of many recent events in the field, to warn a brief note. It's that, quote, a substantial, substantial economic advance in the less developed countries may require modifications in the available stock of material technology. And that's exactly kind of the point of these examples where technology mismatches constraining productivity growth. It's really you need to think about technology in a different way. You need to think about redirecting technology to the extent that you actually want to facilitate growth in a variety of sectors, not just kind of take technology as given and then thinking about sort of redirecting industry and industrial production sort of after that. Um, that's everything I've gotten and I've got, and I'm really looking forward to the other talks and to questions. So the, the question that we were posed was, was the question of what's the role of industrial policy in, in African development. And I guess I want to start by kind of reframing the question, narrowing it a little bit. And in particular, nowadays when people talk about development, they're talking about uh, sustained improvements in the quality of life of people. And traditionally, economists have often thought of GDP per capita as, as a good proxy. And in, in recent years, there's actually been a lot of thinking about the problems with GDP per capita as that proxy. There's actually been a, a proliferation of, of other broader measures that incorporate things like health, education, opportunity, uh, the environment, uh, inequality. So there's things like the Social Progress Index, the Human Development Index. There's lots of institutions have these measures. Uh, but actually a striking fact, if you actually dig into those measures, if you look especially um, at the low and middle income countries, the correlation of all of these indices in GDP per capita um, is almost spot on. So despite all the limitations of GDP per capita, uh, in terms of not including some of these other things, it turns out as a, as a practical matter, uh, GDP per capita is actually almost like a, a, a very good index for these broader measures. So I think, you know, despite the limitations, I think GDP per capita is a, a good measure uh, uh, for development, not because it literally captures everything, but it, it turns out a lot of things we care about are highly correlated, especially for lower uh, income countries. And then when we think about GDP per capita, the key point is that the large gaps in GDP per capita are almost perfectly accounted for by the large gaps in GDP per worker. And the punchline from this is, is that to first approximation, the issue of development closing um, gaps in quality of life between people in Africa and other places in the world is basically a question of closing productivity gaps. So, so I think the key question is what's the role of industrial policy in terms of closing product uh, output labor productivity gaps across countries. And then kind of the broader question, the background, I think, uh, and, and Jacob already mentioned this in his talk, is, is the broader question is what's the role of government in terms of helping to close those gaps? And then in particular, if there's a role for government, to what extent does that role take the form of industrial policy? So that's the, the how I want to frame the question. Now, I think it's important to start with some, if, if closing productivity gaps is the key issue, I think it's important to start with some basic facts about those productivity gaps. So I want to talk about three facts. Uh, so one source of facts is a exercise called development accounting, which everybody here is probably familiar with. Lots of potential issues with that methodology, but basically this is a methodology that tries to decompose those gaps in output per worker across countries into three terms. One part that's due to the amount of capital per worker, one part that's due to the skills per worker, and a third part, the residual, which we call um, TFP. And again, 
lots of issues in that literature, but I, I think the stylized, uh, uh, robust fact is, and especially in the African context, um, the, the gaps in all three of those uh, factors are relevant, but the gap in TFP is, is the largest, the dominant one. That raises the, the question of what's the source of those TFP differences, and there I want to talk about three factors that can play a role. One of them is, was in some ways the focus of Jacob's talk, which was uh, maybe the relevant frontier for a country. There's a country-specific element to the frontier, uh, and that could explain some of the differences in TFP across countries. Uh, but I want to talk about two other factors that I think are, are critical. One is simply slow diffusion of best practice methods or, or relevant frontier technologies across um, countries, that there's knowledge out there about how to organize production, best practice methods, and, and, and even when the technology is appropriate, there's slow diffusion of those ideas across countries. I think there's lots of, of evidence about that. The, the third factor I want to talk about is what the literature has called misallocation, which was within some given sector, uh, you can look at the technology that's being used by all of the individual firms, but then we're allocating labor and capital across these firms, and there's a lot of evidence that that allocation across those establishments is particularly distorted in less developed countries. Uh, so there's been a, uh, you know, an explosion of work that kind of follows the, the seminal work of Shea and Kleenow. Uh, and again, that's a methodology that has many issues, but, but kind of everywhere this is done, they find particularly um, large effects of this misallocation on measured TFP. And I'll say in, in Africa in particular, uh, in the agricultural sector, the, the uh, effects of misallocation on total productivity are, are enormous. So I think, you know, Jacob rightly pointed out that there's an important issue of the, the frontier, but I think beyond that, there's just massive taking as given what the productivities of, of different uh, farmers are, uh, huge misallocation uh, across that. The third fact I want to talk about has to do with measures of productivity gaps at the sectoral level. And here there's actually um, somewhat of a shortage of data, but that is, is being addressed over time. I want to kind of point to an organization, the Groningen Growth and Development, uh, GGDC, um, which is an important developer of data. And we now have, I would say, um, expansions in our, our data in order to talk about uh, and compare measures of productivity at the sectoral level. And what we see when we look at that data is, is uh, two patterns I want to emphasize. So of course we have very large gaps at the aggregate level. Uh, turns out there's large gaps at all the sectoral levels as well. The gaps are largest in agriculture. They're a little bit smaller in manufacturing. The gaps are smallest in the service sector. Uh, um, but in particular, what I want to point to is the gaps in agriculture and manufacturing are actually larger than the gaps at the aggregate level. Uh, and I think that's a, a key fact to be aware of. So that's a few facts about um, productivity that I'll draw on. The next thing I want to point out is in the context of sometimes industrial policy is thought about in terms of changing the structure of production, I want to talk about two aspects of the structure of production in Africa, which I think um, need to change if there's going to be development in Africa. So the first thing is a simple observation. There's the fraction of employment that's in agriculture in Africa uh, is enormous. Uh, there are still some countries in sub-Saharan Africa where there's in excess of 60% of the uh, workforce uh, employed in the agricultural sector. There's simply no scope for a country to become uh, a middle income, let alone high income, uh, if it has more than half its workers in agriculture. Um, although in rich countries, um, agriculture is very productive and people in agriculture can have high income, the only way you can achieve that is actually by having uh, a very high ratio of land to labor uh, in these countries. And if you've got a large population, you can't have it, you can't have 50% of your people in agriculture 
and, and achieve that sort of income per person in agriculture. So something has to change with the um, reallocation out of agriculture. That's a very simple problem. The second thing I want to point out is something that's not at the sector level, but it's actually you know, in any given sector, and that's the, the nature of production. And, and this was mentioned, alluded to yesterday by Nina and today by Jacob. The structure of production in uh, most African countries is completely dominated by uh, very small enterprises. And a lot of times people say small and informal. I don't want to talk about the informal. I just want to emphasize the small aspect. And it's, it's even in some ways worse than small. Uh, one of the features of employment in sub-Saharan Africa is how much of it is takes the form of self-employment. So you, you're not even just talking small establishments, you're kind of talking a whole bunch of self-employment. There's important work by Oriana Bandiera, which is, is documenting that for a large set of countries. And again, there's simply no scope for a country to become rich if the, if the structure of production is all uh, self-employed people or family-owned enterprises where only family workers work. That's just um, not going to happen. So those are things that, that need to change. Now, from the perspective of industrial policy changing the structure, uh, as I said, the key question is to what extent does industrial policy have the hope to, to produce productivity gains? And there's a popular notion, been around for years, it will probably continue to stick around for years. It turns out it has uh, very um, high staying power. And it's the notion that there's um, large productivity gains to be had if the government can simply move economic activity across some broad sectors. That's an appealing idea because the idea is that it's not that, it's potentially not that hard for the government to move activity across broad sectors because you can do that with some kind of relatively simple subsidy type patterns. Um, uh, and the, the example that most people have in mind with this is, is that somehow if we just can move some activity into manufacturing, um, good things are going to happen. And what I want to point out is despite the popularity of that notion, uh, it's long staying power, I think the evidence is simply just not there to support it in any sort of a, a widespread fashion. So let me talk about a, a few facts which kind of uh, tell us that, that that's not a very um, powerful strategy for productivity growth. So first, I already alluded to the fact that in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but it's a, a fact more broadly about um, less developed countries, um, the gaps in manufacturing productivity um, are actually bigger than the gaps in aggregate productivity. So just in a mechanical way, if you actually moved all your activity into manufacturing, the gaps would actually be bigger than the current gaps um, we measure. Um, so, so that already suggests one problem. Uh, more recently, there's been some important work done using um, micro panel data. Uh, um, so that there's a paper by Ted Miguel and co-authors that looked at data from Kenya and Indonesia. There's a paper by Jorge Alvarez, who was a former PhD student here, who looked at data from Brazil. And, and one of the, again, one of the observations that sometimes suggests to policymakers that somehow if you just move workers across sectors, there's something magical that's going to happen, is when you look in the cross section, you see that average uh, wages are higher in manufacturing than agriculture, for example. Um, so it turns out when you actually have micro panel data, you can actually follow the workers that actually move from one sector to the next. And what Ted Miguel and co-authors and Jorge Alvarez have found is, is that if you thought that those cross-section gaps are a good measure of what you get when you randomly move people from agriculture into manufacturing, <coughs> you're kind of off by, a, by an order of magnitude. So, so those gains are, um, those cross-section differences are just um, not indicative of the um, gains you can get at the margin by shifting workers. And of course, one rationalization of that is, is that there's sorting of workers between agriculture and manufacturing, and so the average, the, there's unobservables associated with the manufacturing workers. Um, the third thing I would point out, uh, and again, this was uh, mentioned by Nina yesterday, and Jacob mentioned it earlier today, in several um, sub-Saharan African countries, employment is growing in manufacturing, and yet there's, there's kind of nothing coming from it. And why? Because the nature of the employment growth is all in these very small uh, establishments, a lot of self-employed uh, people working in manufacturing. It turns out that expanding that doesn't have any magic uh, benefits to the overall economy in terms of closing productivity gaps. 
Uh, and lastly, I'll talk about some uh, a recent uh, data set that's come up from the GGDC, the Economic Transformation Database, which is a very nice database. Uh, 51 uh, mostly less developed countries from 1990 to 2018 with data at the sectoral level. And, and in that data set, there's a large variation. And there's a lot of poor countries, but among those poor countries, there's lots of variation in terms of, of what they've done with their employment structures, what they've done in terms of productivity growth, some success stories, some, some non-success stories. And a, a robust fact that comes out of that data is actually the countries, so the countries that had the large, there was actually a negative correlation between the expansion of employment in manufacturing and overall productivity growth. Um, so again, just uh, flies in the face of this idea that if only you just put more workers in manufacturing, something great is gonna happen at the aggregate level. Um, what is a, a different robust correlation there is, is that productivity growth in manufacturing is highly cor correlated with aggregate productivity growth. Countries which did better at an aggregate level in terms of closing gaps also did better in manufacturing. Turns out they also did better in other sectors and the key point there is it's all about productivity growth, um, just shifting work. If you're not very um, high productivity, shifting workers around isn't a recipe for success. You actually have to increase the productivity of the activities that you're engaged in. Now, so, so the point there is I think the idea that simple policies that just kind of rearrange workers, I don't think there's a large scope for that to be very powerful as a, as a source of development. When one starts to talk about more nuanced policies that, that kind of are, are um, go deeper than that, I think there's some major issues that one has to think about in the context of, of Africa in particular. And again, uh, Nina yesterday talked about this and Jacob talked about it um, in, the, in, the, in his talk. And that is the issue of state capacity and, and governance. Uh, that anything which, which you start to think the government is actually going to get involved in the micro operation of particular establishments, you have to be very worried about what the capacity of the government is to actually um, carry those things out and how liable they are to be captured uh, by various vested interests. And so I think those are very serious policies. And I think I alluded earlier to this misallocation literature, and I, was, I think there's good reason to think that a lot of the misallocation, which is a source of low productivity growth, is precisely because governments are getting involved in various ways. So I think it's a case where potentially less is, is more in terms of that issue. So um, having said that, I want to turn to the broader issue. What are the things that government can do, what seem like um, you know, reasonable things to facilitate productivity growth, some of which was were talked about by Jacob, by, and, and some of which came up yesterday. What are some kind of obvious things that government can do uh, that can help? Well, I think one thing, again, emphasized yesterday, uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, somehow having the any modern economy in terms of the nature of transactions that are going to take place is going to require the movement of goods and services, uh, and actually infrastructure is critical to that. Um, uh, transportation, communication, uh, you know, something as basic as electricity. We talked about that yesterday. If, there, if there's not reliable supply of electricity, how are you going to possibly um, incentivize firms to engage in the adoption of, of best practice methods uh, which rely on electricity? So infrastructure, I think, is key. Education, uh, uh, you know, a potentially important component of overall productivity growth. I think there's also good reasons to think in terms of adopting best practice methods, uh, the skills of the population are probably an important component there. So, so thinking about infrastructure, thinking about education. I also want to think, say that I think thinking about um, competition policies, the structure of industry is something else that, that where the government can potentially play some role. This again relates to the issue of, of misallocation, but I think as, as people study microstructure in various industries in Africa, I think there's a lot of evidence uh, that there's um, very bad outcomes associated with monopoly power uh, that is potentially a, a barrier uh, to entry by uh, new firms and adoption of, of better technologies. Um, 
So I think those are, are some of the things that the government can do. I mean, Jacob talked a lot about uh, the possibility to facilitate adoption of best practice methods to facilitate um, knowledge, so I agree with that. I would say there's some other issues of, of note. Um, so a lot of those issues are not special to Africa. I think there's a couple things that are um, special to Africa, um, which I just want to note. So, so yesterday, um, some of the comments talked about the legacy of the colonial period and how that's created um, uh, some persistence in terms of, of uh, various aspects. I think there's obviously a, a, a previous literature about the legacy of, of the slave trade on Africa uh, and about how this has had effects on various things that you might call social norms or social capital. Leonard um, has worked a lot on that, about measures of trust. Um, so I think there's issues about social norms um, in, in Africa that might be um, shaped by uh, factors that are uh, Africa-specific. I think uh, gender is not something that's been brought up so far in the conference, but I think there's issues about gender norms uh, in terms of utilizing the potential of the labor force in terms of productivity. So I think those norms are, a, I think, a challenging issue. Um, I don't know, I offhand don't have any good suggestions I mean, uh, for how governments are going to change that, but I'm quite sure that industrial policy is, is not the way to think about changing those norms. Um, the last thing I'll say, uh, and Caroline made this comment yesterday in the context of financial innovation, saying it, it takes a lot of um, hard work. And what I want to say is, you know, the productivity gaps in Africa and advanced countries are enormous. And you might think that because the gaps are enormous, somehow there's, it's kind of easy to kind of catch up because there should be some low-hanging fruit. I want to say is, is the fact that the gaps are large indicates the possibility for catch-up, uh, so it's feasible. But I think there's nothing in the historical record to suggest that it's easy. Um, look at all the success stories, uh, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Japan, that what's going on in China, India. I think there's nothing in the historical record to suggest that it's somehow easy to catch up. There's, uh, it's tremendously hard work. Uh, the catch-up process comes from individual entrepreneurs who actually do a lot of hard work to create the businesses to make them thrive in those sorts of environments. Uh, yesterday, Leonard, in his opening comments, talked about entrepreneurial capital. And if you're going to grow businesses, again, as I emphasized, Africa's the structure of production is, is just not where it needs to be for an economy to be productive. There's a huge need for some entrepreneurial um, inputs to kind of grow those businesses, but that requires tremendous effort. There's nothing easy about it. And I also don't think that industrial policy is the, the key to uh, enabling those sorts of, of entrepreneurs. So uh, with that, I will stop. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, very nice to be here. And excellent presentations, um, particularly the, the last one, the emphasis on uh, productivity. I also touch briefly on uh, productivity, productivity gap. Um, my presentation is entitled The Politics of Industrialization in Africa, uh, but it's very much uh, related to the title of the session, which is on industrial policy. But what I thought I would do uh, is to flip the discussion a bit, and I think that's what uh, my fellow panelists have done as well, to start with the problems that an industrial policy should address, ideally, um, in order for us to get to industrial policies that actually work, because uh, the history and experience of Africa, and indeed um, some other parts of the world, including Latin America, including some few countries in Asia, is that uh, industrial policies have had very mixed 
results at best, and in certain cases there have been a lot of failures. So perhaps starting with the problem that an industrial policy is meant to address might be um, a good uh, starting point. So what I'm going to talk about um, is um, outlined here on the slide. Uh, and I thought I'd just pose a couple of questions uh, to kind of go through the uh, discussion. The first is really kind of back to basics. What is industrialization and why should a country industrialize? Uh, because uh, maybe a lot of us here are in agreement that uh, uh, industrialization makes sense, but it is still contested. There are people who think you know, countries don't necessarily need to go through that difficult, messy process. Um, and then addressing the question of why Africa has really not industrialized for the most part, uh, and then examining whether Africa really still needs to industrialize, and if the answer is yes, through what pathways. And then finally concluding with a few points around maybe things to think about with respect to industrial policies that could be effective uh, in the 21st century. So why industrialize? And I'm going to go through this very quickly because uh, I'm in a room in which uh, I'm sure a lot of the people here uh, understand very much the process of structural transformation. Industrialization is associated with that. Uh, it is a process through which an economy transitions from low productivity to higher productivity, um, uh, closely associated with the manufacturing and, of course, the provision of services. Uh, but a couple of uh, aspects of structural transformation, including the technological innovation, uh, the movement of labor uh, through specialization, migration, and then, of course, urbanization, rise in productivity, which is really the glue that holds everything together, as we've heard from Richard. Uh, and then complementarity also, I think that's very important in agricultural productivity growth and the development of non-agricultural activity in manufacturing and services. But then everything also is quite dependent to a very large extent on uh, the manufacturing industry, uh, because this is historically uh, a sector, if you want to call it that, uh, that has that tends to have high, somewhat high or higher productivity, that is characterized or associated with diffusion of technology to the rest of society, that has high forward and backward linkages to the rest of the economy, and in fact, uh, we know that factory work can affect deep social change in a society. Um, again, you know, this is kind of a rehash of what we all know, that industrialization does transform society. It is associated with, I mean, when we look at the historical evidence, with higher incomes, higher living standards, and higher human development uh, uh, index, if you want to use that measure. Um, um, then, of course, you know, there are some exceptions here and there. The uh, wealthy, um, oil-rich, Gulf Arab monarchies, or some of the entrepreneur city-states, Hong Kong, Singapore, although they also have significant manufacturing sectors, but they tend to be somewhat of an exception here. Then we also know that industrialization induces behavioral change among individuals, within households, and in societies more broadly. Uh, they can change uh, power relations and dynamics in households, they can rebalance, oh, industrialization can rebalance gender relations by empowering women. You know, you think of uh, garment manufacturing, you think of Bangladesh, South Korea, Morocco, uh, where um, uh, female labor force participation rates were greatly accelerated by uh, manufacturing-based industry, particularly garment industries. But here's the thing, and, and, and perhaps this is where um, you know, I, I, I want to make a, a couple of uh, key points. Um, industrialization, and now we tend to kind of romanticize it, um, as, 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 as Ethan mentioned. Uh, even here today in the USA, uh, we know um, an industrial strategy has been unveiled by the White House. You know, there are fact sheets on the uh, uh, website of the White House, um, the new in American industrial strategy. So it's kind of romanticized a bit, and we tend to forget that it is a very difficult, very messy, and very ugly process. 
you know, if we want to use the Marxian terminology here or conceptualization, it is characterized by exploitation of labor by capital through low wage work, sweatshops, minimum social insurance, and even child labor. Um, and with a wide range of externalities. And I think I want to pause here and state a caveat. Um, I think throughout this presentation, I'm not necessarily endorsing or condemning anything. I'm not saying, you know, um, you know uh, 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 low wage work is bad or good, just in describing um, uh, the state of play. Um, so there are externalities, negative externalities of resource depletion, environmental devastation, but also positive externalities, you know, jobs, somewhat better jobs than, you know, the back-breaking work that people do in rural areas with no pay, um, or for women, unpaid work, uh, unpaid, uh, whether it's childcare and, and other kinds of activity, rising incomes, technological diffusion, the linkages we spoke about, and also transformation of social relations in society through unionization. And we know the um, impact that unionization has had on the creation of the welfare state in Europe, here in North America. Um, so this is really the reality of industrialization, but we tend to romanticize it a bit. It is a very difficult and ugly process. So if it's difficult and ugly, how is it that countries are able to industrialize, at least those that have achieved that objective? And my argument is that, in fact, for a country to be able to successfully industrialize, it has to be part of a political objective. So nobody, no country just kind of waltz into you know, manufacturing-based industry or creates strong, dynamic industries. Or you know, it doesn't happen by coincidence. It's a concerted effort of mobilizing resources you know, guiding the private sector, and we've seen this happen, uh, you know, historically. So industrialization, for it to happen, has to be a means to achieve a political objective. And what is that objective? It is to consult. It could be to consolidate power, to strengthen military and economic capabilities, to fight an external adversary, or to prevent internal implosion. And across the board. Uh, the uh, experiences of industrialization from uh, the early industrial revolution of uh, uh, Britain and parts of Europe, so the early industrializers, as they're called, uh, of the 19th century, uh, to the late industrializers, Germany and Japan, in the early 20th century, again, you know, just because I have this picture or photo doesn't mean I'm endorsing anything, so <laughs> stating that caveat. <laughs> but uh, trying, to, trying, to, trying to make a point here. To um, the 20th century late, late industrializers, East Asia, uh, to the Chinese miracle. Across the board, one thread that is very common is that industrialization was a political objective of um, achieving self-sufficiency, of strengthening military and industrial capabilities, of trying to survive um, across the board. So if industrialization is so important, it has these huge transformative economic and social impacts. Um, and there's a strong imperative, even for a continent like Africa, to industrialize why hasn't it happened? But before we get to that question, let's look at the state of uh, industrial transformation in Africa today. And I'm just going to highlight three key simple indicators. The first is you look at manufacturing value added. And there are a couple of papers here and there that are you know, being published. But this is one of the most interesting ones that personally I have come across. Uh, published in 2021, which uh, looks at uh, manufacturing um, uh, value added, so manufacturing share of GDP and share of employment. After the lost decades of the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, manufacturing share of output uh, did not necessarily 
uh, increase in Africa, but the share of employment increased a little. Um, as you can see, uh, this is just, the, the, they have data from uh, uh, 2018. It's at 8.4% for sub-Saharan sub Africa. Perhaps if you add Morocco to that, it might, uh, uh, the number might go up a bit. Um, but manufacturing share of GDP um, is actually less than it was uh, about a decade ago and much less than it was uh, more than 30 years ago. So there's some kind of incipient, slow and glacial progress, but it's not sufficient to be described as uh, industrial transformation happening on any significant scale. And then productivity, and uh, Rich, Richard has uh, you know, done a good job of really going through that. Um, you know, output per worker, uh, if you look at labor uh, productivity, um, has actually declined. So it, was, it declined for about two or three decades from the 1960s, and only really started to recover in the early 2000s. And then from around 2015, there was a dip you know, with the crash in uh, commodity prices and a number of other drivers. Then the third indicator, um, exports diversification. Again, just even just simplistically, if, you, if one um, disaggregates um, Africa's uh, um, exports to the rest of the world, um, raw materials continue to comprise the bulk of exports. Uh, more than 50% of the total. But um, Southern and East Africa tend to, the countries there tend to have a relatively more diversified export basket than West and Central Africa. So why has Africa not industrialized? Back to the question. Uh, and I want to put forward three key explanations. So the first is that um, the African continent, and here I'm kind of generalizing, but many countries, this applies to actually many countries, have still not, so the first factor is really internecine conflict, as I call it. And internecine conflict is not uh, an Africa-specific phenomenon. But I think the challenge in, Afri in many African countries is partly due to the history of state formation, and a number of other reasons, um, there are unsettled conflicts on the continent. And you look at a country like Ethiopia, which made significant headway in attracting manufacturing FDI to its special economic zones and industrial parks, an unresolved conflict has put a lot of that progress in jeopardy. A lot of the firms have closed down, a lot of the people who were employed in those industrial parks, have, some of them are now unemployed. And there's just a lot of uncertainty about the future of some of those industrial parks. This all happened within the past three years after all the progress that, that Ethiopia has made. So there are, there's a challenge that there are unsettled conflicts on the continent, um, whereas other parts of the world, you know, if you look at Europe, has gone through its own centuries of conflicts, uh, but those have to an extent been resolved, culminating in the creation of the European Union for that reason. So internecine conflict, I think the unresolved nature of that, the, the unsettled balance of power among different groups, uh, the history of state formation, uh, all uh, uh, undermine uh, the, the, the process of industrial transformation. The second point I want to highlight is with respect to Africa's persistent vulnerability to external shocks. Um, every perhaps decade and a half or so, there's a cycle of fiscal crisis and debt crisis. We saw this in the 1980s, in the early 2000s, and again, was witnessing that cycle again. And I think our colleagues who made presentations yesterday went into that in a bit more detail. Um, you know, there are several reasons for that, but there's a persistent vulnerability to exogenous shocks, uh, perhaps due to the nature of financial flows for investments, due to the, uh, you know, absence of patient capital, so the kinds of uh, uh, um, financing for investments, 
um, uh, uh, meaning that uh, macroeconomic policy is constantly oriented towards crisis management. And the, the, the third um, point I want to highlight is, um, and it's interesting that now you know we can. Uh, <laughs> This is a point that we can make uh, in the open because people are making it very, very clearly that in fact there was a neoliberal period and we have reached the end of that neoliberal period. We're entering a new era of everybody uh, unveiling their um, industrial policies. Uh, but at a certain point in time, um, policies, the Washington Consensus policies that really discourage planning and some kind of state intervention in the economy in favor of unbridled markets um, may have contributed to um, Africa, African countries just not being organized and not having a clear strategy with respect to industrial transformation. So then the next question is, you know, having gone through all of this, does Africa even still need to industrialize? Is this necessary? If yes, through what pathways? So let's try to examine the first question. And uh, yes, Africa does st it still needs to industrialize. And in fact, um, when I first read uh, Hajun Chang's uh, book, 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism, this was uh, back in 2011 or so, I, 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 I made a note of that quote. I think it's on page 23. And I had been looking for opportunities to use the quote. <laughs> and he says, it is a fantasy to think that developing countries can skip industrialization and build prosperity on the basis of service industries. Now, this statement and um, you know, some of the other things he's written and a few other people have written happened at a point in time when there was actually a debate. I mean, that debate is kind of still going on, but not, it's not as... Um, as contested as it was back then, that whether industrialization is even necessary. You know, India was put forward as an interesting example of what African countries should potentially aspire to at the time, focus on, uh, you know, ICT, tech, um, and focus on uh, the uh, call centers, you know, and th that kind of approach to raising incomes, creating jobs. So it was a very, very interesting debate at the time. Um, so what, what I want to do here as I um, prepare to round up is then to identify four other imperatives today for Africa's industrialization, for Africa to pursue uh, industrial transformation, in addition to all that we've seen already about the historical experience of other parts of the world. The first is with respect to um, jobs creation. Of course, this is not a new thing. But what is different this time around is that Africa is now the region with the world's youngest and fastest growing population. Uh, the median age in the continent is around 18, 19 or so. But it's actually much lower in some countries like uh, Republic of Niger, Chad, Central African Republic. Um, so it's a young continent with a very fast growing population. Around 14 million people, I think, join the labor market every year. And with respect to the actual jobs that are created, I think there's a gap of around 10 to 11 million people, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as we've already heard from our previous speaker, um, there's a large informal sector on the continent. Uh, of course, with a lot of variation, South Africa tends to be a unique outlier here where the informal sector is actually quite small, but which also then uh, creates this uh, 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 um, uh, high rate of uh, unemployment because the informal, there's no informal sector to absorb people. Uh, but uh, in, uh, on average, eight out of 10 people uh, are employed in the informal sector in low-wage and low-skilled activity, mostly in agriculture. There's a bit of an error on the chart on the lower right-hand side of the slide, but the dark blue is meant to be, um, uh, uh, um, I think, is meant to be agriculture. So, with this, uh, you know, young population uh, without jobs, 
we are already seeing the impact, the negative impacts of just not creating good quality jobs for people across the continent. Uh, in West Africa, in uh, Central Africa, in East Africa, we're seeing restiveness in, in, you know, in, in, in various pockets, instability, conflict, and of course, migration. So that imperative of jobs creation is very, very key. A second imperative is to try for African countries to try to capture the gains of a green economy in a low carbon future. Um, as we know, with climate change, uh, you know, the entire world has to transition to um, uh, 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 economic systems that are less carbon intensive across the entire spectrum of you know, agriculture, uh, uh, in, um, uh, power generation, transportation and mobility, etc. cetera. Um, but African countries need to industrialize, need to invest in uh, industrial upgrading to be able to localize the value of natural resource endowments on the continent, particularly transition minerals, uh, bauxite, copper, and all of those things that are input to renewable energy hardware and also uh, input to uh, battery technologies. Um, African countries also can be able to, if they pursue industrialization, develop the value chain of renewable energy hardware, batteries, and electric vehicles. And there are some interesting things going on in Zimbabwe, in Egypt, in Uganda, with investments in um, electric vehicle um, assembly going on there, mostly by uh, Chinese investors. And then finally, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, tech diffusion uh, uh, of, of you know, these uh, low carbon technologies can create new innovation ecosystems as well as auxiliary industries. So according to IRENA, uh, in uh, the year 2021, 12.7 million renewable energy jobs were created. And they estimate that by 2050, up to 26 million jobs in renewable energy industries can be created in Africa. So there's an opportunity here, but there needs to be a clear focus. The third imperative, and this is, again, another point that um, just five years ago, we couldn't have made this point with a straight face. People would laugh at, people would laugh at you if you mentioned the imperative of securing national control of strategic industries. But recent events, you know, whether it's COVID-19 or you know, supply chain disruptions or trade wars, etc., have made it very clear that countries need to secure control of certain strategic industries, whether it's pharmaceuticals or digital infrastructure. Do you want your adversary building your 5G telecoms uh, uh, infrastructure? Probably not. Or your data centers? You want them to be as close home as possible. Energy infrastructure, electric grid, transmission lines, this we already knew. But then now, the security of energy supplies, where your energy comes from, is key. This is something that the Algerians and Moroccans have always known, but you know, others have kind of not really known. Uh, but now, with the war in Ukraine, it's becoming very, very clear. You know, not just the, raw, uh, the unprocessed oil and gas, but also refined fuels, petrochemicals, etc. So the um, infographic on the right-hand side of the slide is a mapping done by the Peterson Institute based on data by, uh, from the International Energy Agency. And it maps um, uh, the, su the supply chains of oil and gas and also for minerals for clean energy technologies. Uh, basically, they map the uh, energy superpowers across these two types of um, uh, 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 energy industries. With oil and gas uh, upstream, midstream and refining, and then uh, downstream with respect to consumption, uh, the US, uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, you know, the traditional energy superpowers that we know are dominant. But when it comes to clean technologies, basically technologies of the future, for this low carbon future, that's where it starts to get really interesting. And unfortunately, Africa only features on the mining side of things, which is uh, the DRC with cobalt. Um, an, an interesting story here is the story of um, Indonesia with nickel. Indonesia has now become the world's second largest refiner of nickel, and this happened within the last five years. 
Now again, in the spirit of not endorsing in, uh, or condemning Indonesia's approaches, uh, it's definitely something very, very interesting because they are trying to replicate the same model in bauxite. Right. So the other one final thing I want to highlight here is with respect to processing, you can see that China is quite dominant <coughs> across the entire value chain of clean technologies, processing, uh, battery, uh, uh, packs, uh, assembly, um, uh, polysilicon, uh, across the board. So just securing national control of uh, strategic industries, I think, is a key priority for uh, serious countries. Um, then the final point, uh, just very quickly on this, uh, for African countries is that uh, they have to industrialize to navigate an increasingly turbulent global environment. Um, unfortunately, the global environment today uh, is not going to make it easy to even pursue the kind of export-oriented industrialization that, Africa, uh, that Asian countries pursued. Because market access is going to become very, very difficult. We're seeing more protectionist policies in high-income economies, uh, from the CBAM in Europe, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, the in uh, Inflation Reduction Act. In fact, that's a, an excerpt from the uh, page 149 of the Inflation Reduction Act, where it it's specifically provides for local content. Uh, so it's very, very fascinating. So that's one aspect of a, an increasingly turbulent global environment. There's also a decline in concessional finance for development. We've seen UK aid cuts, Swedish aid cuts, but also the World Bank, uh, there's an evolution roadmap document which is currently being discussed, is planning to start redirecting some financing from low-income countries and fragile states to middle-income countries. Right? So it's just going to be very, very turbulent and very complicated to pursue export-oriented industrialization. I think I'm just going to conclude very quickly by mentioning that there are still pathways for Africa to pursue industrial transformation. Uh, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, but you know, there's manufacturing-based industrialization, the traditional stuff that we know. There's leapfrogging through digital technologies, and there are various dimensions of this. And maybe we can talk about it in the Q&A uh, session. And then there's this I also find very interesting. It's work done by Brookings and also by UNU Wider on industries without smokestacks. Uh, that uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, African countries can consider uh, new industries that share characteristics of manufacturing, so efficiency, tradability, technological diffusion, um, but that are pro probably not as environmentally devastating uh, or ecologically devastating as um, uh, manufacturing. This is really the final slide. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is then you know, trying to put everything together. When thinking about an industrial policy, what is it, what, what, what are the certain principles, what are perhaps principles that countries can start thinking about? Of course, the industrial policy in every country is gonna be different, right? You know, there are, uh, there, there's a high degree of context specific specificity. The first is really, defining what the political objective of industrialization is. It's not, again, nobody walls into it. You know, nobody kind of happens to become you know, an industrial superpower. You have to be very, very determined to do that. Second is having a capable bureaucracy is absolutely essential. I mean, even in this country, the US, the world's largest uh, market economy, uh, there's a very strong and capable bureaucracy. Never, n never mind the fact that there are people who do not agree with the deep state or big government, but there's a strong and capable bureaucracy. The third is just being very selective in investing uh, in, in catalytic pro-productivity interventions. You know, on the supply side, also on the demand side. Again, it's really, really going to vary, but there are you know, certain things that are fairly uh, common knowledge. And then the fourth, and for me personally, I think this is important because this is what causes the cycle of fiscal crisis and debt that tends to happen every 15 years. Finding ways to create buffers against persistent external shocks. Thank you.
Excellent. All right, is everybody now convinced we actually do need industrial policies? Uh, we'll take questions while uh, we're taking them. And I see there's, I just want to make one quick comment because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Taiwan or South Korea miracle. Uh, there is often a view that this was driven by very smart industrial policies. The fact of the matter is, the United States, it was the United States that gave Taiwan 45% of its gross domestic capital formation in the 1960s. And as part of that, and similar to South Korea, as part of that, the United States insisted that Taiwan privatize state-owned ind industry. The United States saw Chiang Kai-shek and Syngman Rhee, for that matter, as incredibly corrupt. They did not want Chiang Kai-shek and Syngman Rhee to control state industry because they thought they were using them just for means of political power and not for economic growth. And so a very explicit goal of U.S. policy was to dismantle state-owned enterprise in those countries and to promote particularly small and medium-sized enterprises, which, of course, Taiwan in particular exemplifies. So I think there's a lot of myth about industrial policy in that part of the uh, world, which we might want to think about before we go all in. Um, so I see a bunch of hands. Sir, let me start with you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I did like the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I just need to, to comment in a way that uh, on the continent, we just need also to understand where we are now. We are in the fourth uh, industrial revolution. And uh, we believe that uh, the industrialization on the continent is weak. We need to accelerate. It's why we have what we call accelerating industrialization in Africa as one of the frameworks on the continent. And uh, also, we, uh, we understand very well that uh, industrialization, if we, 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 we learn from the United States of America, we can see that even infrastructure, I don't know if you have to respect the fiscal policy to make sure that tax and uh, uh, government spending remain equal. Sometimes you need to go beyond because you have a vision. But some, some, in most of our countries, we have to focus on uh, 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 population well-being or the manifesto of the political party because it, it, has, it has an impact on how people can be okay. And also, when we check the, the Sustainable Development Goal, we have industrialization, innovation, and infrastructure. So uh, we understand very well that uh, there is a linkages as far as uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goal are concerned. And uh, 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 through that, we also understand the issue of energy is uh, very critical. We have the issue of load shedding of Africa affecting most of the industry. I don't know what we have, what, what we have to do. And now, what we are, we are in a process of making sure that uh, 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 national development policy uh, 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 are framed in a way that uh, we consider the structure of uh, the GDP of that country. Because we cannot push a country to move further in industrialization where we discover that they are focusing more on services. And we had a case in Seychelles during COVID where they got zero forex because they only focused on uh, Tourism. So uh, those are some of the aspects that we have to consider. And uh, to conclude, I can say that uh, uh, data that we collected, what we are observing is that uh, innovation is happening mainly during the acquisition of equipment. And uh, uh, if we go back saying that we have to invest more in R&D, we are going to have innovation, then we go back to the uh, linear model and we can be seen in, in considering that aspect because we have more firms that are innovating without doing R&D. But in the current knowledge-based economy, innovation-led economy, we understand that to protect your, your product, at least you need to do a bit of R&D. So that is, in general, what we are observing on the continent. And we believe that we framework that we have focusing on education, science, technology, and innovation, even the next iteration of the framework will start in 20, uh, next year. So I think uh, uh, we still have more to do. And uh, breaking those countries in uh, regional economic communities to understand even the aspect of macroeconomic convergence, uh, going, uh, being linked to the policy and uh, the industrialization aspect. So this is just a comment I would like to give you in terms of setup based on data we got from member country when it comes to R&D investment and uh, innovation for competitiveness. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we only have like five minutes. Uh, so let's take a couple of questions and um, we'll uh, then wrap up.
Sir, you have one, and Bing, you have one. So, sir. Uh, for Jacob, uh, do you worry that agriculture is in some ways peculiar, that it doesn't depend so much on global supply chains? So if you want to develop a new technology for Africa, uh, you know, you either you sort of use generic parts that are available in, in the world market, or or you, and there may you may be you're stuck. You can't really do very much that's different. Or if you actually want to do something different, you have to develop your entire supply chain. Um, so manufacturing is so much about you know putting things together and buying things off the market. So that makes it much more difficult to shift the technological paradigm than than you would even in agriculture. In principle, as you know, there are examples of technologies that are developed for developing countries in developing countries. Mm -hmm. It's less obvious that it's so easy to do, <clears throat> especially in a very globalized supply chain. <coughs> Maybe we'll just take then Bing's very quick question, and we'll have to just wrap up because we're past time. Wait, can we take all the questions even if we don't address them? Uh, well, we've got exactly two minutes. So then very quickly, Bing, and then this gentleman, quick. and then we'll... I, 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 is it possible to pull the last, the last slide of Ms. Usman's presentation, the, last, the very last slide? Is it possible to pull up? Uh, Why don't, while we're doing that, sir, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> I'm Art Cray from the World Bank. Uh, I have a question for Jacob as well. Um, so it sounds like you're ad advocating for different types of industrial policy, and I'm wondering whether you've considered the suitability of sort of smarter, smarter policies like uh, advanced market commitments for meeting, you know, for generating the financing, the advanced demand for, um, um, for say, these tests that, that, that you were discussing. And the second part of it is, you know, to what extent are these technologies not being developed because of the difficulties in uptake? So we know a lot about, say, the difficulties in adoption of fairly run-of-the-mill technologies like fertilizer. And so maybe it's not so much the lack of generation of the technology that's the problem, but um, manufacturers are expecting problems with uptake. Okay. Um, I, uh, I very much agree with Ms. Osman's slide, but I, I want to use Taiwan's development of the semiconductor industry, which might be the stellar example of industrial policy uh, <clears throat> uh, in connection with this slide. Uh, first of all, the number two, a capable bureaucracy, is I completely agree with Ms. Osman in that Taiwan is very fortunate in the sense that in the 1980s, the head of economic planning was someone who majored in physics. So he could see the potential of semiconductors. Uh, and also he had a personal network of people in that industry. So he was able to draw some of the top talents in semiconductor Taiwan back in the 1980s. And I would add a fifth point to Ms. Usman's slide is human capital. I think one important reason why Taiwan semiconductor industry took off is because Taiwanese colleges graduate very large number of engineers. I read somewhere that 25% of all college graduates in Taiwan major in some form of engineering. And so quality human capital, I would add as a fifth point. Great, great. So can folks just wrap up quickly and then, Jacob, start with sure. you and um, we'll back down. Yeah, I, I, can, I can work backwards. So starting with the, the second question, the question of to what extent is it a, a, a feature of, of uptake and demand? So I mean, without getting into too many details, and part of the analysis that I presented in a different part of that paper, we looked exactly at how this kind of measure of technological mismatch in agriculture actually affects technology adoption among smallholder farmers in, in survey data for eight countries in Africa, and we find that it has a big effect. So the existence of this appropriate technology as we measure it does seem to actually affect uptake, and there's other evidence that, you know, Pavnit Suri has a great paper focusing on hybrid maize adoption in Kenya, showing that like people are really doing what they should be doing to the extent that the technology is productive for them. Um, so I think that that's, that's one thing to think about. Um, in terms of um, different types of contracts, like advanced market commitments, I think that there's, there's, there's some evidence that that could work, and I think thinking more broadly about different types of contracts that, that could work in, in, in lower-income countries is something worth thinking about. There's new work on, on self-enforcing contracts, so to what extent can you have an agreement between the innovator and the producer that kind of sort of 
in, enforces itself. I think in terms of specifying that contract in the context of agriculture, it's kind of complicated. So what are you exactly asking for in exchange for that lump of money in, the, in, in an advanced market commitment sense? Is it a corn variety that is resistant to this particular pest this year, but maybe not next year? Is it a certain productivity level in this particular plot of land in this particular country with this particular set of ecological conditions? But then what does that mean and how do you price that? I think it just gets really complicated in terms of thinking about sort of specifying that, but that's something that I think would be really interesting to work on um, going forward. In terms of the question of sort of agriculture versus non-agriculture and the importance of integration in, in global value chains. So there's actually already some evidence that within manufacturing, production that is or is not kind of part of, of an international value chain, these kind of measures of skill abundance, uh, technology mismatch proxied in a variety of ways, seem to affect productivity more when you're kind of... Um, Integrated. So it already seems to be true that that is kind of posing a barrier to the extent to which different types of technology can matter. Although, so I mean, the, the, the short answer is I don't know. I, there aren't as many examples that you can think of of real uh, kind of attempts to, to do local R&D investment in manufacturing in the same way that there was in agriculture. But it would be interesting to think about kind of all the dimensions along which they can be different and how you could kind of facilitate one and not the other. But, but I wonder kind of what real attempts that that would look like kind of in the future. Thanks. Richard, any Last words? No need. No need? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, absolutely. Human capital. Human capital, absolutely. And in fact, I have it there, but it's kind of nested in the pro what, what I call uh, pro productivity interventions. But here, I think the emphasis is on selectivity because there are the general kind of investment climate reforms, that is not going to cut it. It has to be very precise and selective. I mean, what work for Taiwan? probably would not have worked for Hong Kong or right. know, Singapore, for that matter, even though they're kind of in the same region. So that, absolutely, I agree with you. Well, thank you so much for this really stimulating panel. And this debate is definitely going to continue. So thanks for this great, great discussion.